Welcome to the second installment of Global Forest Watch's Frontiers and Forest Monitoring webinar series. My name is Alice Gottesman and I'm Global Forest Watch's User Outreach Specialist. Today we'll be presenting on the science behind forest change data, providing a deeper understanding of how we get from a satellite image to the pink pixels displayed on the Global Forest Watch map. All right, before we get started, I wanted to give an overview of how you can ask us questions about the webinar or communicate with us if you're having technical difficulties. If you have a question about what we're presenting, please click on the Q&A button and type it in there. At the end of our presentation, we'll have some time to answer questions that were typed into that section. If you're having technical difficulties, please communicate directly with us through the chat button. Please note that we will not closely be tracking content related questions placed in the chat section, only in the Q&A section. You can stay on top of the latest in forest monitoring with Global Forest Watch's Frontiers in Forest Monitoring webinar series. Through the series, individuals and organizations can learn more of the fundamentals behind the data on Global Forest Watch to make better use of it for monitoring and protecting forests. In the first installment, which can be found on the link attached to this presentation, we provided foundational information about remote sensing. We'll be sending this presentation with the link attached to you all after the webinar. So let's get started. Our presenters today are Dr. Matthew Hansen, the Director of University of Maryland's Global Land Analysis and Discovery Lab, or UMD-GLAD, Kai Kresik, Global Forest Watch's Data Specialist, and Michaela Weiss, Global Forest Watch's Project Manager. Matt is a remote sensing scientist with a research specialization in large area land cover and land use change mapping. Kai works to streamline and manage the process for updating and incorporating data into the Global Forest Forest Watch platform and associated applications. And Michaela leads Global Forest Watch's strategy and partnerships for satellite based forest monitoring. She has a particular interest in on the ground use of early warning deforestation systems and leads Global Forest Watch's engagement with law enforcement. The goal of the webinar today is to provide you with an overview of the methodology behind core satellite based forest change data sets on Global Forest Watch such as the annual tree cover loss data and the GLAD deforestation alerts. The next installment in the series will be intended to dive into the future forest monitoring technology. Global Forest Watch offers an integrated, openly accessible suite of tools uh, designed to enable experts and non-experts alike to access information about forest change and mobilize action. Some high level examples of how this is done include increasing knowledge and transparency about forest landscapes. Global Forest Watch tools and data offer access to the state of the world's forest to everyone everywhere for free. Harnessing information to mobilize local action by governments and civil society. We have a variety of partners and some programs that help promote data driven action. And lastly, advancing private sector action to stop commodity driven deforestation and manage forests sustainably. One of our tools, GFW Pro, allow the private sector to measure risk associated with their supply chains. Here's an example of what you can see on the Global Forest Watch platform. This particular data set is the near real-time GLAD deforestation alerts, which Matt will be talking about soon. The GIF visualizes as tree cover loss spreads, indicating a new logging road entering a national park buffer zone in Peru. Global Forest Watch and UMD GLAD are partners in producing and visualizing forest change data. In the early 2010s, the World Resources Institute had been doing a lot of work on forest monitoring in a few countries and realized that the improvement of technology made it possible to provide easy access to forest monitoring information online. Simultaneously, UMD GLAD was working on the annual 30 meter global tree cover loss data, which was published in Science in the fall of 2013. Then in February 2014, Global Forest Watch was launched with a focus on the tree cover loss data covering the time frame of 2001 through 2012. Since then, Global Forest Watch and UMD GLAD have collaborated on annual updates to the global tree cover loss data. Over time, we also realized that people needed more near real time information so that they could quickly respond to forest change. 
The near real-time GLAD deforestation alerts were started in 2016, having been published in a paper in On Global Forest Watch for three countries, gradually expanding to cover the tropics. UMD GLAD and Global Forest Watch have complementary roles. UMD GLAD produces the data and Global Forest Watch easily visualizes the data for the public and provides trainings on how to use it. Now we're working together on improving the annual tree cover loss data, monitoring restoration, and adding new sources of satellite imagery to improve the level of detail of the GLAD alerts. We'll dive into this in our next webinar, so keep an eye out for that to learn about where we want to go next. Moving forward, we'll provide an overview of forest change data methodology, then a demo of the Global Forest Watch map and dashboards, ending with time for question and answers. I'll now pass it off to Matt. Thank you all for uh, attending. It's very nice, our global community virtually getting together uh, on our shared topic of interest in, uh, you know, special concern to the global environment, uh, sustainability of forest. My talk will be on um, basically giving you an update on our forest monitoring and some background on how we do it. All the names here. Peter Potapoff is the co-director of the GLAD lab and, and uh, running all of our data processing for inputs and outputs uh, with Setlana Turbanova on the forest loss. Um, global product that's annually produced. Uh, other folks, Amy Pickens runs the alerts. Um, Sasha Takavina does a lot of our, uh, let's say, accuracy assessment. Everybody here contributes. My talk will be uh, on the annual product and the alerts, but also on some applications. Um, our, our system is based on Landsat currently and Landsat's our longest Earth observation record of the planet. And at the front end, it's, it's a lot of uh, engineering, well, it's, it's a combination. I would say our, 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 our skill set includes uh, obviously science, but also computers, computer programming and, and systems engineering to produce the data sets and process them. And of course, we're geographers, so we are very interested in the environment and spatial relationships. So it's an interdisciplinary um, approach to characterizing the land cover and land use of the planet. And we start with each individual Landsat image. We run algorithms that quality assess the pixels because the data we use are optical and that means they're highly contaminated by the atmosphere, water vapor, aerosols and the like. And so the, this medium between the land surface and the satellite is our is our enemy uh, in terms of you know seeing the, the land. So we have to get rid of uh, clouds, cloud shadow, haze, and the like. Once we do the QA per pixel, we can uh, stack up those pixels and find uh, compare them to uh, a reference, and that's the MODIS. It's a NASA instrument that has been in operation since um, 2000. And we're part of the MODIS land science team and understand how those data are processed and it's daily data. And so we can have a much better image of the earth against which we can compare the Landsat data. So as we, as we, as we push the good quality observations out, we compare them to the MODIS and we correct them radiometrically. So we push them one way or another to, uh, to look like the MODIS. And once we have that, we have this normalized Landsat data that are seamless. And this is the critical step because, because if you have seamless data in space and time, you can run algorithms on them that, that can be uh, looked at as consistent. The outputs can be compared uh, if you're doing forest extent or forest loss across geographies across years. So the whole, the whole backdrop is really this. If we can get the data in good shape, we can make maps. And this capability is generic. It, we, we, I'll, I'll show a few examples later of us mapping commodities, the, 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 the drivers, uh, the threats to uh, replacing forests, particularly in the tropics. Um, so it is a big data operation. Our system is 15 petabytes of data. We're expanding over 20 petabytes. Uh, to absorb Sentinel-2, um, but it is built for purpose. Uh, we don't, we're not, um, we work also in partnership with Google Earth Engine 
they, uh, we ran our initial algorithms published in the science paper on Earth Engine. It was a fantastic partnership with Rebecca Moore and Matt Hancher. Our alerts are being run on, on Earth Engine right now. Um, but we also process our annual data are processed in house and so are all our, most of our other products. To get a clean time series, we uh, take every, Landsat's nominally two sensors every eight days. We, we can take those, sense those data and put them into a 16 day composite product so that we have a very systematic temporal feature space. And from that systematic feature space, we can start looking at time series of spectral responses. And so these examples are, are obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but this is a, a deforestation event where you have very high greenness, very low shortwave infrared in the blue and the red. And when the forest is cleared, the green, your NDVI goes down, your sphere reflectance goes up, and some other measures, you know, react in kind, such as the normalized difference water index. And you see this uh, change, and that's, the, that's what we're looking for in both the annual map and the alerts. The alerts are really hanging on one observation. The annual product is, is using an entire year's worth of data to make a map. So in the end, uh, when we have time series of this, these data, we can, we can, we can process uh, forest cover and, and change. Um, these data, the, the parlance now is, we call this analysis ready data. Uh, the 16 day data are available at our website for people to download and test and use. They can be pretty heavy in terms of volumes, um, but basically the inputs to uh, our, our algorithm are the 16 day data and they're available. Peter Potapoff wrote a paper and, uh, and has put out some tools to uh, facilitate their use. Um, we're happy for people to, to try that out. But it is a, if you're working on a small geography, it's very nice. Obviously, if you're working at national country scales, it, it gets to be very challenging. Okay, just some background on the data volumes. Um, and it's tricky because Landsat is not truly operational. It's not like weather satellites where uh, any capability that, that is um, impaired is immediately replaced because we don't sacrifice um, you know our, our 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 safety from the from from weather events. Um, in, you know it's not a research operation; it's operational. So in 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 Landsat, it hasn't quite gotten there, and it's a spotty archive. So the data richness you see these bars over time reflect that that the capability is improving over time, but it makes it difficult to do historical mapping that's consistent with the present. You never complain about having more and better data, but Landsat's, while it's a, it's a long record, it's an inconsistent record. Um, but right now, we're, we're, we, the acquisitions around 250,000, the, the data that pass through the processing to, to be usable for mapping are between 150 and 200,000 globally. And that's, that's quite a nice place to be for the annual mapping. Um, we're part of the Landsat science team. And uh, so we, we are um, privy to the, you know, the different processing levels and the aspirations of different uh, uh, data sets as products, whether it includes atmospheric correction or, or not. Um, how does the geometric correction uh, improve over time? And all these things really impact our ability to process the data and whether we might have to reprocess the whole archive, for example, when they come up with a new uh, version for geometric correction, we'd, we'd have to reprocess everything. And so it's good to be on the team, um, but it does, uh, you know, these are big volumes and we have to react uh, accordingly. Okay, so we have very nice, clean uh, time series data. We can turn those, uh, and, and those time series, again, these are, these are graphs of dynamics. Um, forest in these examples are, forest loss are in D. D is an example of a, logging in Canada, you see a brief cluster of observations with a gap, then a cluster of observations in the gap. So the gap is winter, low sun angles. We don't, we don't include in our data set. We also throw out uh, snow and ice. So we usually have a very shorter and shorter growing season as you go up to higher latitudes. But here it is, here's the logging event in 2016 and we pick that up and map it. F is also forest. This is a uh, uh, forest in, uh, in, a, in a commercial forestry subtropical location. So you see the clearing, but you also see the regrowth very fast. So the net dynamic uh, for when we're mapping gain 
changes uh, according to climate. Here in this time series, we see the regrowth in, in, in the boreal. It's, it's a de many decade uh, pro process. Switching to the alerts. Um, so the alerts are complementary to the annual and uh, they are meant to be more of a management or you know, near real time piece of information that can be acted upon. Um, they're being processed daily. So if there is an overpass of Landsat 7 or Landsat 8 that is a land observation, we run the algorithm. Um, I, the GFW picks up a, a weekly uh, summary of that. Um, as Allison said, it's, uh, it's between plus or minus 30 degrees, so we're covering the tropics. We can extend it. It's just a matter of time and effort. Uh, we could pretty easily, I mean, conceptually, the, the method for extending it is all written out. We could do that, and we hope to do that soon. Um, we tune it in a way that is meant to be conservative. So when we talk about alerts, we have a different standard for accuracy. When we, when we run the annual product, we want to make a disturbance map that is close to the true area as possible. It is wall to wall. Um, but even for that, we try to reduce commission errors, but it is, it is wall to wall. And we think it, uh, it, it is our best effort in terms of getting something close to the complete area of disturbance. With the alerts, we try to limit commission error because if people are going to use it as a management tool, we cannot, we cannot commit error in the middle of forest, have people go out there and find out that there was no forest change where we said there was. So it's meant to um, be an indicator product, not an area estimation product. And in that way, it's complementary to the global map. Uh, it serves a different purpose, it's more timely, but it's not definitive like the the algorithm that runs on the entire year's set of observations. This algorithm runs on single looks. So when we get a new image, we run it, we compare it to history, and we flag the change or not. So here we see, this is in southern Peru, we see a logging road go in and the alert uh, flashing. So if we have a particular confidence in, in the difference between this new image against its entire history, we can say, uh, based on that single image, we'll flag uh, a disturbance. And in this, in this example, and it's typical of Landsat, you can see the roads for, from logging uh, um, activities pretty clearly. The extractions off of the side of the road less so, but you can still see some of them. But Landsat is, is quite limited when you combine the eight-day repeat with the cloud cover of the tropics, for example. It's, it's, um, it's, it's tricky to do, to do this. But we don't need to get the entire road. We just need to get part of it to be able to be uh, of service to what we think are the applications that it can be used for. So in terms of the processing for the alert, it's the same thing. We have the, a single Landsat scene um, that goes through our pre-processing, uh, like I described before. It is cloud masked, it's normalized. So it's in the same kind of uh, processed level as our historic data. And so we have historic time metrics of uh, integrated time series, and we have an algorithm that compares those metrics with the new image. And each pixel is labeled as loss or no loss. To, to uh, kind of uh, to combat the issue of commission loss, we have a, when we have a single detection, we, we call it provisional and we, we map it. But then we look within 180 days for four next observations. And if one of those also is a detection, so we need two detections. We get the multiple criteria and we call that a confirmed detection. And there is a big difference because our quality assessment back here at the beginning when you're at the cloud masking and normalization phase, you can, it's not perfect. And uh, so we can get single detections that are, that are, that are uh, wrong. And so we do have this uh, check in the product of two states, uh, provisional and confirmed. So here's an example of uh, reference Landsat 2000 of our annual data uh, uh, through 2016. This is what it looks like. And so when we run the algorithm in this example, 2017 uh, for the alerts, we get this summary, uh, this is 2018 data, um, where the, the cyan is confirmed alerts and the blues are single detections or provisional alerts. And in this case, we're picking up a lot of, uh, a lot of fire in the Jingu, uh, upper Jingu basin, a popular, I mean, iconic kind of satellite monitoring site uh, of uh, indigenous reserve hemmed in by a lot of land use and uh, eroded from within by a lot of fire. And that's what the image looks like that we're 
a composite of the year which we mapped the loss. So you can see the, the new alerts and then the burn scars from the loss. We're adding Sentinel-2 data to, these, uh, to, the, to the system. Sentinel-2 obviously has, has advantages both in time and space. It, it has a higher cadence uh, than, than Landsat, but uh, 10 to 20 spatial resolution, 20, 10 to 20 meter, which is obviously a, a big step up. So here we, we're just showing the prototyping of this, of this method to, to see the alerts. And, and the big challenge with Sentinel-2 is it doesn't have a thermal band uh, which is really important for QA. When we have thermal and Landsat, the clouds are high contrast and we have a, a, a lot of leverage, a uh, much easier path forward to do, to do QA. And with um, Sentinel-2 not having a thermal makes it harder. So that's our, our issue. And when, you, when your QA is not good, you tend to have higher error and that's bad for alerts, <laughs> bad for anything. So here's an example from Sentinel-2 compared to Landsat. Um, this is, these are Sentinel-2 images, a reference image we have some logging going on in 2018. I don't know if you can see this so well. We have 2019 logging uh, image here. And then the typical thing with logging is that the recovery is very fast. So cadence, the cadence is very important as well. You need to have dense time series to pick up the logging activities when they're ongoing. So this image is really just shows that there's really nothing to see after, after a few months uh, post logging. Here's what Landsat alerts look like. This is in Peru, in southern Peru. You can see, uh, you can see that uh, it's a good alert product. It picks up most of the road network, some pixels, and the pattern you can immediately kind of grasp is, is a logging pattern. Uh, so as an alert, it, it does well. Um, Sentinel-2 looks like this, and now, well, now we're doing much better in terms of a comprehensive delineation of the infrastructure associated with the logging, picking up some more of the actual extractions. And then when we compare the two, we're a magnitude greater with Sentinel-2 in terms of area mapped. So this is the clear advantage. Um, we, with the 10 and 20 meter, it's just you know, intuitive that you're gonna see more. The, the, the cyan is where we pick up Landsat and not Sentinel-2, and that's very small. So Sentinel-2 um, really outperforms Landsat. We have to you know, con convince ourselves also that the, the commission errors are not greater because of the QA challenge of Sentinel-2. Um, so we're still working on that. But this, pro this product uh, was developed with the All Eyes and the Amazon support, um, partners Hevo, Greenpeace, and WRI. So the Sentinel-2 in particular, we want to thank that, 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 that uh, support. And we are working in the project areas of the All Eyes and the Amazon in the Amazon Basin. And we'll extend uh, by the end of the project, at the end of this year, we'll have pan-Amazon uh, Sentinel-2 alerts working. And they will scale. One of the things I want to highlight or emphasize is by doing the processing at a global scale, by doing this um, front end consistently, when we run an algorithm in the Amazon basin and we port it to the Congo, it does well. It, you know, there will be issues that we might need to modify and adjust, um, but the idea is that things scale. So in the case of the Amazon, we work in the project areas of, of Hevos and, and Greenpeace, and then we fill in every area between because the data are consistent enough to allow us to do that in the algorithms. Uh, take advantage of that consistency. So the uh, alert product is uh, is um, available uh, at our website, Global Forest Watch, and as an asset in Earth Engine. And this is an example from the Caripuna uh, Reserve in uh, in Hondonia, uh, Brazil, where you know a lot of backsliding has has occurred with in terms of. Um, Indigenous people's rights and governance from Funai and Obama and the you know, withdrawal of a lot of protections. So our data and the other folks on the ground, in particular the other folk, the people on the ground, the, the, the indigenous peoples themselves and the groups that support them are doing some really challenging work in a, in a, in a stressful environment. And anything we can do to help them, we, we are happy to. I can show you, um, an example of the alerts on our website. This is running uh, updated again daily. I just want to show this area of Novo Progresso. This is where the day of fire occurred last year during all of the uh, um, fires in the Amazon. And you can see that, uh, where are the detections? There they are. So here are the clearings for this, this year so far. So Novo Progresso is down here and all of these big clearings out on the edge in the foresters, the national forest, the Jaminshan 
Um, you can see kind of like the after effects um, and even maybe even a political signal here that people are, are quite uh, um, comfortable uh, clearing new forests. So this is what, you know, the, the value of, of the alerts really. We have some new information in a hotspot landscape where there's been a, a highly contested uh, issue of governance. And so these data um, help illuminate what's actually happening on the ground. And then the different uh, interested parties, stakeholders, whether it's local private landowners or companies or NGOs or government can work from a set of facts to try and uh, find a way forward in terms of governance. Okay, so I'm gonna show another example of uh, something akin to alerts, but it's, uh, it leverages the alerts. So one of the, uh, generically for um, our, our global map, we're gonna do a global validation. We're gonna use uh, Planet, the commercial data, which is uh, this three meter near daily global capability, which is incredible um, in terms of the spatial detail and the, and the temporal frequency. And I want to show an example of those data for force loss, where it really does show, does kind of uh, um, demonstrate an improved capability. This is a, an example of a Landsat image over a logging concession in Northern Republic of Congo before the logging occurs. I'm going to start with Landsat and then I'll go to Planet and you'll get a feel for uh, the difference in the data. We love Landsat, by the way. I don't want to beat up on Landsat, but here's Landsat. This is all true color, so it's not any... You know, this is the way our eyes see it, more or less. Um, here are the logging roads coming in. You can see all the haze and the, sh and the clouds that make it hard to run algorithms on this. This image here is the one that was most coincident with the logging itself. That's our best image, and it's impossible really to, to map with it. But you can see through the haze a lot of disturbances off, to this, off the sides of the logging roads. That's the, that's the sweet spot when the logging is occurring and you have that high contrast. We don't see it. The next year in April, all we see are the major roads. The logging extractions are, are uh, have been uh, um, basically erased by the recovery of vegetation. And this is what our global algorithm maps. So our global algorithm mainly picks up the roads. And so the question is, if you're doing degradation monitoring, like how, how do we get at that signal? How do we do that more? How do we do that better uh, systematically? So now I'm gonna switch to planet. And here you have, uh, the pre-logging um, picture, and, and I, I'm not showing all the planet data, but planet is remarkable for its density of data in terms of time. Um, we've used it in places where we're getting almost daily coverage. Uh, not here, but it, it's quite good. Here's the logging road coming in. Here's some extractions occurring. This is a nice image. This is a pretty straightforward image to QA too, because you have really high contrast with the clouds and the shadows but you can see very clearly the logging. There is a, that's the, the best one. This is high contrast, three meter data in the middle of the extraction. And you can see all the logging uh, sites, the skitter trails and the like. So the whole picture is very clear here. As, as, as you go past this September 2018 image, you see the recovery of the vegetation. And just like with Landsat, Planet can no longer see the extractions and by January, all you have are the roads. So again, this, this, this points out the two things the planet has that are fantastic are the three meter detail, which allows you to see the small gaps of the logging activities and the high temp frequency of capture of imagery that allows you to overcome the ephemeral nature of the signal. So that's our, our global map. Here is the, what we should be mapping if we're gonna get at the degradation signal. So what does this mean in terms of uh, you know, our annual or, 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 or alert mapping? We have proposed and uh, are looking into this idea of doing hotspot mapping where, where we can task, uh, or not really task, but acquire the, what the planet imagery over places like this, this where we see that it's a logging, a logging, uh, it, new logging um, exploitation, and we can build out the area estimate much more precisely by leveraging that. So it kind of, and Map Biomass has this uh, in operation in Brazil, where they're taking our alerts and other alerts, and then uh, um, getting planet data and other data to build a a kind of piece of evidence, a story 
around uh, the activity and taking that to the authorities and the like. We'd like to put algorithms on these data and, and say and estimate really what the area is going on in, in terms of the forest, the footprint of the forest uh, disturbance. I guess maybe the last thing, you know, we, we I, have, I have a bunch of examples um, outside of the, the topic of the conversation, but we just uh, were putting together products with um, that are leveraging other, we always integrate data. So we're leveraging the JEDI mission, which is a LIDAR mission. This helps us to better calibrate our algorithms for forest structure. And so we have uh, um, taking the LIDAR shots and the metrics derived from them and using them as training data to map global tree height, for example. So this is an example of that. Um, I can show very quickly what this, these data look like. So this is a first run of 30 meter height from JEDI, the integration of JEDI as calibration. And, and it's just very nice in, in a number of respects. Um, the height of these uh, swamp forests in the middle of the, the Congo Basin, the Kuvet Central, they're shorter, they're more uniform. And JEDI sees that and JEDI can turn that across our Landsat image. And then when you zoom into a place, you can see the logging on the terra firma. You can see all the extractions on the terra firma, but they don't log the, the wetlands. It's, uh, it's, it's illegal and it's also, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's really difficult to, to work in, in, the, in the wetlands, but this is kind of a neat, a neat characterization enabled by the calibration of the, of the LIDAR heights. Um, and so that'll be something to look forward to. And in the end, what we will do is we will uh, have time series of structure. And this is also work from Peter Potapoff uh, where he prototyped this in Southeast Asia um, time series and those data are available. But basically when you have time series of structure, we get, we get the big clearings, the big losses, but more importantly, we have, a, uh, we have a better rule set for doing gain. So on the right, we see a lot of gain. This is Uruguay uh, forestry putting eucalyptus on old pastures. And the idea is that over time, when you see heights increasing, cover increasing, you can put in biophysical thresholds and say whether or not something has actually officially become a forest. So you might apply a five meter, 30% or 60% cover threshold. And if that is crossed in the time series um, and it's persist, you can say, okay, we have regrowth. So going back to the annual product, this will be uh, another one of our goals is to complement the disturbance with recovery, gain, whatever, a forestation, reforestation and, and do net, net uh, dynamics. Um, I think I better, I mean, I got too much stuff, but I, Else, Matt, okay? Matt, I'm going to cut you off and Good. ask that you stop sharing so Kai can uh, do a demo. <laughs> Thank you, though. Hello, this is Kai Kresik. Thank you, Matt, for your very thorough explanation of the different forest change products through UMD. Um, I'm going through a brief a demonstration of the Global Forest Watch map. And my focus today will be how you can leverage the map and the dashboards to perform your own customized analyses and get results using the tree cover loss data, um, the deforestation alerts, and the tree cover data. So um, this is the entry screen of Global Forest Watch, and I'll just give you a brief tour around the map. So as you can see on the left, this is the legend where you can see the various data sets. Um, on the farther left here are the different types of data we have. We um, also have a, several contextual data sets such as land use, climate, biodiversity, and land cover to supplement these forest change data sets. Also on the corner right down here, we have recent satellite imagery through Landsat and Sentinel. We also have these map settings right here where you can activate satellite imagery provided by Google, Landsat, and Planet. Um, so now I'm going to talk you through how to interact with our various data sets on the map. So this is the tree cover loss data right here. And I'm just going to show you how you can look at a time lapse of this data. So as Matt explained, this data is available on a global scale. And I'll just zoom around to show you. So for those of you where GLAD alerts do not um, operate, you can still get some really interesting information on tree cover loss in your region. Um, other things that you can do with these specific data sets are um, adjust the tree cover canopy density right here. Um, so we get a lot of questions about what tree cover 
um, loss for candidate fee density is. So you can see here that we can change from 10% all the way up to 75%. And we do this because forests look different around the world and we may need a more denser threshold to describe a certain forest, um, for example, brush forests, or um, we could use a, a smaller threshold for other types of forests. Um, Global Forest Watch uses 30% um, across the board. This is generally what we use to estimate forest canopy density across the world. Um, additionally, we have the tree cover data set, which uses those same definitions. You can do the same kind of operations here. And if we go into here, you can see the layer information. Um, you can access the paper, which um, Matt Hansen and his team worked on. You can learn more about the methodology behind this data set. Um, you can also scroll all the way down and download the data via this link. Um, you can open it in ArcGIS and you can learn more and this link will take you to their website. So I wanna show you one thing that you can do in terms of analysis with these data sets. So I'm gonna zoom into Brazil right here as my example and then go to analysis. So for those of you who are looking at statistics on a country level scale, um, you can easily do that by clicking the shape to analyze. And then you'll see here on the left that you get very specific information about Brazil. Uh, you can get this graph of tree cover loss, um, tree cover in Brazil and deforestation alerts in Brazil. Um, we also have various other analyses that you can leverage. Um, and then up here on the right, you can download this data, or you can even share this analysis uh, via a link in Embed, Twitter, or Facebook. Okay, so now I'm going to go kind of further in and show you another feature of our map. So while you can click on administrative boundaries, such as Brazil, or in this example, Pará, you can go even further in and define your own area of interest. And I think this is really helpful when you're trying to monitor a small location that um, interests you. So you can go into this setting right here, draw or upload shape, and then click start drawing. And let's just look at this area right here. So you can click an origin point and then basically define your whole area of interest. So this kind of lets you do this without having shape files or without a predefined area. So as you zoom in, you get some of those same analyses here on the left. And then again, you can also share this. And then one feature we have right here is the subscription. So if this site, is, if this area is really important to you, um, you can click subscribe and you'll receive email updates. And every time you have a GLAD alert in this area. So I find this really useful and people who are monitoring a very specific area might find this useful as well. Um, okay, so the next thing I'll show you um, is our dashboard. So the way that you can access this is via clicking here and then clicking dashboards. So this is a whole suite of tools that use both the forest change data created by UMD as well as our various contextual layers. So we have this both on a global scale and a country level scale. And these are very, very powerful analyses and uh, data visualizations that you can integrate in reports. Um, you can integrate them visually in blog posts or your website. And so they're very, very versatile. So this is the global annual tree cover loss uh, analysis. And as you can see, it goes from 2001 to 2018. But um, looking at these settings right here, you can actually change the uh, years that they show. You can change the canopy density like we discussed before. And then you can even look at tree cover loss within intact forests, primary forests, and then a variety of land categories, in this case, protected areas. If you're interested, you can download the information from this graph, no matter what settings you change. And you'll get um, an Excel file that has all the information you need to run your own analysis or to visualize your statistics. And then additionally, you can share or embed this widget uh, or this analysis the same way that you can do with the maps on the interactive map that I just showed you. So again, it's the link, embed, uh, Twitter, or Facebook. And then going down here, I'm just going to show you um, one more capability by going into Brazil specifically as an example. Oops. There we go. And then I just want to show you that you can do these really, really specific analyses too. So let's say you're interested in Pará. 
And then even within PRA, there are these specific administrative units here. So let's say we're interested in this area right here, Altera. And so you can even get these statistics at this um, high of a level. So you'll see just for this small administrative boundary, the different forest change um, patterns over time. And then you can also see um, GLAD alerts in the region, um, tree cover, very, very specific. And then if you're interested in downloading all of this information, again, you can download data by analysis, or you can actually download um, a bulk download of just this area or all of Brazil up here. And then again, you can switch your language up here and you can sign up to create your own areas of interest and subscribe to different administrative areas that um, you're interested in monitoring. All right, and then I'm gonna go back to the slides now and show you some ways that you can download um, a variety of different data sets, such as the ones that Matt showed you. And I just need to stop sharing. Um, these are areas where you can actually download the raw data. So if you wanna do your own analyses using the Hansen data, you can download them all via these links right here. Again, we'll pass out this uh, presentation so that you can access these links, but you can access the forest change data via Google Earth Engine. Um, via the Global Forest Change website uh, through the University of Maryland and Google Earth Engine. And then also you can download GLAD alerts uh, via this link right here. And you can download them um, specifically by um, latitude and longitude. All right, and so a lot of you have expressed interest in learning how to do your own analyses on forest change data, as well as how to work with remote sensing data and various GIS systems. So we've compiled here several different tutorials that you can take. Um, some of them are through Google, Google Earth Engine, um, NASA, QGIS, um, the Canadian Natural Resources Remote Sensing Tutorials, and the Harvard Center for Geographic Analysis Tutorials. So these tutorials are all free, and they will walk you through how to do remote sensing analysis and work with specific uh, geospatial data. All right, and that's all for me. And so next up, we will do a Q&A session. Thank you, Kai. And thanks everyone for joining. We'll now open it up for a Q&A. So if you have a question, please enter it through the Q&A section. We'll do our best to get through most of your questions, but there are quite a lot. So um, if you enter it through the Q&A section, we'll be able to track your question. And if we don't get to it today, we'll try do our best to uh, email you with our response. All right, so we'll get started with a question from Oleg. Um, Oleg says, good morning. I wonder what is the threshold in the general methodology behind quantifying forest gain, such as reforestation? How is it distinguished from the invasion of herbaceous vegetation? And are there any prospective goals to identify forest type or specific species, comp specifically species composition change? Okay. Um, so when forests recover, whether it's natural or managed, uh, we, we, we do treat it biophysically. So a tree is a tree and we're looking for a spectral signature characteristic of tree cover and, and really don't, don't have a problem separating tree cover from herbaceous cover or short shrubs. And that's because the, the tall canopy has a, has a light extinction characteristic to it that other covers don't, especially in the time series where it's persistent. You might have a, part, a particular, uh, let's say wetland feature that might look like a forest in an image, but it won't, it won't persist. So, the time series is really important, but really there is, there is a particular signature in, in red reflectance and other bands that separate trees from um, other confounding land covers. So we, we, we're really comfortable. What the challenge is, is if you go down to four meters, three meters, two meters, now we are, we are running out of that signal. And one of the things we hope with LIDAR is that it'll help us push down our, our, our uh, ability to get woody vegetation. And we don't have that capability yet. We need, we need something like five meters, 30% canopy cover, and that's distinct enough that we can separate it. Um, the second part of the question was on, uh, uh, I forgot. The second part of the question is, are there any prospective goals to identify forest type or specifically right. species composition change? 
Right. Well, I mean, we've we've done in the past as part of uh, some inputs to models uh, products based on leaf longevity and leaf morphology. So this is your classic plant functional type stuff where you have needle leaf deciduous, uh, such as large forests and needle leaf evergreen, broadleaf deciduous, broadleaf evergreen. We can do that, and that's very important for a lot of uh, applications. Certainly, carbon and albedo. Um, but when we we do not get down to uh, species. Uh, identification there there's a lot of talk around that there's always been a lot of talk around that um in that that domain hyperspectral data is is supposed to have the promise of doing that um and it, you know it, it may but being able to extrapolate that signal across large areas is not improving yet so i don't i don't have any any you know anything definitive saying that we're making huge progress on species identification okay thanks matt um, the next question is from Karwo Chong, and I apologize in advance if I pronounce anyone's name incorrectly, um, but they asked, by using Landsat, can we know the type of forest loss in naturally hot weather or humankind activities? Can it be identified by pattern of forest loss, or how can it be identified? Um, we're talking about in, uh, attributing loss to human human induced, like mechanical stuff right yeah whether it's attributed to human activities sure. or if it's natural got it so we we do we do the first thing we do for our attribution is sample based analysis so we we um we can take any country or any geography or the globe and and throw samples in into our loss and use uh, uh photo interpretation very high spatial resolution data landscape context and say this is uh logging this is smallholder agriculture versus this is a, blow, a blowdown from a storm or a disease. In the end, I, I mean, the question is more, is it a distal human impact or immediate one? Because even the, a lot of the, you know, the fire dynamics now are impacted by human modification of the climate. But we can do that. Uh, and we do do that. We have a number of papers where we're separating out loss uh, by different human drivers and the, and the bit of uh, natural. Um, I have so I, I, our first product that'll come out that'll be wall to wall 30 meters will be for the for the pixels of law identified loss that are due to fire, and we will we will make that product available this coming year. We have we have a product for the entire time series that we're evaluating, and it looks great. Um, but even that doesn't answer your question because fire is it human or not, and that's that's hard to do. But if you're in the tropics and the low latitudes, you can generally assume it's human induced. So that is that is on in a mapping spatially explicitly mode. That's a challenge, but we can do that with this sample based mode and report statistics that we think are very definitive on the fraction of forest loss due to different human uh, activities. Awesome, thanks, Matt. Also, if I can just add to that, Alice. Sorry. Yeah, of um, course. This is Michaela from Global Forest Watch. We've also done some work at a global scale uh, at 10 kilometer resolution to quite coarse, but just to get a general sense of the drivers of tree cover loss on a global scale um, that we've done with the sustainability consortium. Um, so that's not necessarily useful for very localized sites, but if you're trying to get a general sense of, you know, how much is due to commodities versus fire or urbanization, um, that's one way that you can tell. Thanks, Michaela. So the next question, speaking of drivers, is from Miguel Hernandez. He asked, with your system, can we know the driver of deforestation in a specific country? For instance, where soy, beef, sugarcane, or other crops are the main drivers of deforestation? Right, we, we do two, uh, this is repeating a bit what, what I just mentioned. We do two approaches to this. One is sample-based, where we, where we can take a country and we can throw samples inside and outside of our forest loss and attribute what the drivers are uh, at, a, at a kind of core scale. We also map specific drivers. Um, we have a time series of soybean that is, I think, uh, can be visualized. I'm not well. I'm not sure. It's 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 a product that we're that we're in the process of of, share, of sharing it with the public. I don't know where we are with that, but um, we we have a study where we've mapped spatially explicitly soybean over time and can, using some um, rules, attribute whether or not the forest clearing. Was uh, was basically re related primarily to soybean or some other land use, um, and when we do these studies, what's really what's really surprising, whether whether we're doing soybean in South America or palm oil in Indonesia, is the lag. How much um, these 
land uses don't immediately occupy the cleared land. So there's definitely an issue of, um, I don't want to say land grabbing, but land tenure, it could be land grabbing, but the establishment of tenure um, and the kind of holding of land and either using it for pastures or something or, or not using it all in the case of, of Indonesia. And then the commodity comes in. So that whole, that whole kind of pathway is very tricky and for, for kind of monitoring and enforcement, um, I think it's a big issue uh, where, where, you know, do you say soy is clean and green or palm is green if it came in five or six or eight years later after, after the, the clearing? And I don't think so. I think, you know, the, the, the idea of the clearing is to look towards that, that, that high order return on investment. But that's a trick. I, I just put that one out there. So we are, we are mapping these things, especially explicitly. We're also doing the sampling to, to get at the specific commodities with kind of finer thematic detail on the drivers. Awesome, thank you, Matt. So the next question is from Zoraida. Um, how did you generate the forest or tree cover loss detection algorith algorithm initially? Um, was it run globally? How did you improve the algorithm over time? That's a fun question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been mapping the globe since 1994, and uh, we worked with uh, very coarse spatial resolution data, first the meteorological satellite data. And so we got very good at, uh, because we had these dense time series from these satellites, we got good at this idea of uh, running global algorithms and running them over, over multiple years. And we, we knew how much, we had, how much work had to be put into the pre-processing the data to enable that. So that was the first thing, a lot of experience practicing with big, big pixels. And then when we got Landsat, uh, we couldn't do it because we had to buy the data. But once they opened up the archive, we're like, okay, it looks like there's sufficient data here globally. We can take the same model that we've been working with and apply it on the 30 meter pixels. There's enough data to extrapolate algorithms globally or you know, they're close, close enough. And um, so we did that. Now, when we map loss, one of the things that's tricky is we map loss as a category. We don't, we don't compare two maps. We don't compare forest and time one and forest and time two and figure out the loss there. That's very hard because your, your, your individual maps are not perfect and you get a lot of error that way. So one of the things that we, we, we focused on, which was a little different, was to, to map loss directly as a category and that's tricky. You have to define it biophysically. You know, it has to have a certain state of, of maturity in terms of, you know, height and cover. And it has to end up as something, we say, stand replacement, something approaching stand replacement. And by de once we define that, we target that and try to map that as the dependent variable. So that's, that's, our, that's what we've been doing the whole time on the disturbance side. Awesome. Um, thank you. So the next question is from Varun. Uh, about ground truthing. Uh, how important is ground truthing while using or collecting information on deforestation? And how do we develop processes or procedures for these kind of activities? Well, it's really important. And we've done it um, in some places really well. Um, you know, at national scales, we are more and more in the field because we, we think the uh, you know, satellites are a really good indicator product and you can get greater precision of estimates if you go to the field. So, um, I mean, I could give some examples, but Republic of Congo, we've done national scale stratified sampling in the field guided by the loss maps. We've done that in the Yucatan and in, 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 in uh, Mexico and the Chaco and Argentina. And the thing about it is, you know, if you do that kind of work, we, we do probability based samples and uh, you have to go to all those places and usually, because disturbance is tied to infrastructure, you can get there. It's not like you're doing a forest inventory where you have a ran, you know, a systematic grid and you have to you have to hike, you know, ten miles to get to the site to measure the trees. Disturbance is tied to infrastructure. So what's interesting is it's doable. You can go to the field at scale and do this. So, um, but uh, obviously, in some places, you know, and security is an issue, um, and, and you can't. Um, so, you know, I think the field is a challenge, but it's invaluable. We get we get a lot of benefit from it, and uh, and you know, yeah, we advocate for it because it's uh, it's definitive. You you have really really great information, and we do it for all of our, our themes, whether it's the drivers, the soybean. We do we do. It's all based on field work because we cannot reliably identify soybean, uh, get areas of area estimates of soybean without, without going to the field. 
And then on, on drivers of loss, we, when we go to, Ch to the Chaco in, uh, for example, in Argentina, we can, from the field, get a probability estimate of how much of it is driven by commodity crops, how much of it is driven by cattle, how much of it is driven by charcoal. So it's a very nice, it's a very nice thing. And, and uh, again, it, it is doable because you can get to the sites usually. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, so the next question is from Matthew Feiner. He's asking, regarding the Brazilian Amazon, we get a lot of questions about the major difference between UMD and INPE data for 2016 through 2018. This difference is important for current policy discussions. Do you have a go-to response for the difference in data results? Well, INPE's product um, doesn't do gross disturbance, it does deforestation. So fires are not in INPE. And our, our biggest uh, loss year, I think it's 2016, it was the El Nino. Huge fires around San Fernando, huge, huge fires in Raima in the Northeast and Xingu, and they're not in the INPE data set. And that, that just blows the comparison out of the water. So we are doing something different. There is, theirs is a deforestation uh, product, which means the permanent removal of the tree canopy for, for uh, agricultural land use typically, so pastures or, or, or row crops. Um, and they also, because of that, they have a different minimum mapping units, like six hec 6.25 hectares. They are not doing, they would never pick up logging. Again, logging is not a per se, it is it land use. It's, it's a degradation, it's not a conversion, so it's not in there. So for sure, we should generally, generally have more loss than INPE, and we do. That, and that being said, we do largely you know, correlate in a lot of places. Now, you get into the spatial domain, what's really cool is that both products are available and we can compare. And for this year, we did some comparisons, and there were some places, a few places where we missed some early, like January clearing uh, because of poor data, and somehow they picked it up. But the, the opposite was also true where they, they missed a number of big clearings. And you know, these are the kind of things that um, are less, less easily explained, but they're, they're not, they're, they're relatively rare where we, where we really you know, do not get the big clearings uh, the same. Um, but the good thing is both these data are out there. Um, and, and I also like Imp Impe has different products where they try to build out the other capabilities, for example, degradation, degradation mapping with DETER. But the thing that I give Impe a lot of credit for, and, and they get a lot of criticism for, is they are staying consistent. They've done this one method for ever, and they stick with it. So Protus is well defined. It is what it is, and uh, I, I kind of like that. That 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 beats the definition of operational. We're trying to be like that as well. Um, we're going to try and reprocess. Impe doesn't do reprocessing, uh, but uh, for sure these are different different products, but still not not uh, orthogonal to each other at all. Great, thanks, Matt. So I think we have time for just one more question. Um, quite a few people have been asking if this data can somehow be used for any kind of future pr predictions, and if so, how? Um, so I'm not sure if you have an answer for that. Well, in, you know, the, the best predictor of future deforestation is, you know, where was it last year? And so th there are a lot of modelers, land use change modelers that, um, that can do that. It's hard to predict where, you know, it, it, can you predict where the new road will go in? And maybe you can, because there's there are some, you know, projects online. So there are a lot of scenarios, I, I would say, scenario-based assessments of future um, patterns of force loss. Um, so, and we just published a paper on fragmentation across the pantropics where uh, it's a very strong correlation in terms of as forests get reduced to smaller, smaller fragments, their pressure on them increases. So information like that, you could extrapolate, you could say, you know, here's a, here's a fragment of this size um, there's this likelihood that it will, go, it will it will be broken up into fragments of this size over this many years. So there are principles behind it. Well, thankfully, I don't have to do that. I mean, I got enough stuff to do, but but uh, there are communities that do that modeling. And um, and and obviously, the the recent past is the best predictor of, of what's going to happen in the future. So use our data to do that. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Michaela and Kai. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, please keep an eye out for our next webinar in the Frontiers and Forest Monitoring series, which will be intended to explore the future of forest monitoring. 
It's being planned for this summer and will be announced on our communications channels. We'll also be sending out a recording of this webinar, as well as a copy of the presentation and a brief survey to solicit your feedback. So please keep an eye out for that email. It was great having all of you. Uh, have a great morning, evening, or afternoon, depending on where you are.